Hello traders, my name is Vadim. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Rob Mitchell and uh, he is uh, one of the best traders that I've ever met. He is my personal mentor and uh, we have been uh, friends for 10 years now. Um, I want to interview him to give uh, new traders, beginning traders and seasoned traders as much value as we can give you of course we can't cover everything that I've learned from Rob over the last 10 years or everything that he's learned over the last 30 plus something years of trading so uh, Rob let me introduce you and um, let's start from the beginning tell us how you started in trading um, before I uh, say that thanks for having me in today Vadim um, I began trading my very first trade in 1978. Um, my mother was a avid stock market investor. And um, so she was always talking about the markets and investing. And uh, this was back in the uh, uh, late 70s was when I took my first trade in about 1978. And uh, my grandfather passed away and uh, left me five hundred dollars and so um, she uh, helped me to invest that in AT&T stock and mm. that was my first experience uh, in placing a trade and now back then you didn't do it the way we do these days uh, you know clicking buttons uh, you know you called the broker and, and this sort of thing and so uh, I uh, held that stock for uh, quite some time uh, then, uh, I believe in about 1984, 85, I took a, 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 my first option trade and um, I uh, bought a bunch of call options and, uh, of course, not understanding those principles completely. Hmm. Um, you know, I just lost the, I just lost it. I think I threw a few hundred bucks at it or something. And But uh, what started happening along about 1990, was I have a degree in experimental psychology and uh, within the framework of that degree we use a lot of statistics and um, experimental design mm -hmm. and so what we do um, is we set up a test and we learn uh, how to not introduce confounds into our research so a, a normal way of saying that would be you set up a good experiment that is uh, tracking what you think you're tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, that That is a key part of my uh, uh, trading and research to this day is just knowing what it is that I'm uh, researching because I always research uh, something before I uh, trade it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference, and you might ask me later, a difference between back testing and testing and statistical testing. Uh, but so in about 1990 or so, I started developing computerized models. Um, back then, you didn't really get streaming data, so I was pulling the data at 15-minute intervals and loading it into my database. I was having the database analyze. The very first system I ever created was looking for basing patterns in stocks. In other words, looking for consolidation patterns. Mm -hmm. And then was looking for breakouts out of those uh, consolidation areas in an intraday time frame and um, and I did that uh, for quite some time up into 1991 or so and I think by 1994 I, I began trading in futures mm -hmm. and um, and then it just went from there uh, but uh, once I um, began developing computerized models and was getting the feedback from the trading I was I was just hooked on the whole process uh, because it it's really um, uh, it's the whole thing for me is like a, a spiritual journey really because mm. it's a mastery of yourself when you're a trader now in the mid 90s right you started trading big size in uh, futures correct um by 1996 I began developing uh, systems um in the uh, S&P mm -hmm. and uh, I did not really fully know the implications of what I was 
headed towards. Um, but uh, I had literally spent, um, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell talks about, uh, 10,000 hours to get good at something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what happened was um, I was literally spending all of my spare time coding systems. I tested everything imaginable. Mm. Uh, every book I could get my hands on, mm -hmm. I bought it, and I coded everything in it and tested it. And so I found out a lot about what didn't work. Um, but then um, I began about 1996 really getting a handle on what worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, at, at that time, maybe I was hitting the seven to 10,000 hour mark or something of, you know, just testing everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for my just sheer craziness and, you know, refusal to give up, mm -hmm. Um, I certainly could have walked away from it. But what happened uh, there was I developed a model in the S&P, and um, it was just astounding. Mm. It was just astounding. And I, uh, I ran an ad in Investor's Business Daily for a newsletter service mm -hmm. for this system that I'd created. Mm -hmm. And I remember that ad was, uh, was expensive. It was like $800 a day that it ran or something, mm. which was a huge amount of money to me at the time. And I think I threw $3,200 at four consecutive weeks on a Thursday or something like that. Mm. And um, and uh, the phone started ringing. This was back before the internet, really, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the phone started ringing at closing sales for my <laughs> service. Mm -hmm. And it, that began taking off in a really powerful way. And then uh, one day I got a call from the owner of a futures clearing firm. And he said, I want to raise you a few million dollars. Is that, is that okay with you? And I said, sure. I didn't really even think anything of it. He's like, he thought I should know who he was and everything, mm -hmm. but I really didn't. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, he, he told me he raised me a couple million dollars. Well, uh, he said, uh, he said, if you're up 50% in a year, we'll raise you a couple million bucks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what happened was six weeks later, we were up 100%. <laughs> 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 and he, and he went just gung-ho, man. He had 600 brokers working for him. Wow. He went gung -ho. And in my office, the fax machine was running eight hours a day. The, the brokers would call and complain they couldn't send in the paperwork for the uh, for the new accounts as so they were coming in. Uh, so, but yeah. do you think you could have done uh, you know the same level of success uh, if you had the same performance, but it was a hundred percent discretionary system? Um, not on that scale. It was not easier to scale up on a mechanical system, right? Well, yeah, because what all kinds of things start happening there. Uh, you know, and I, I mean, I could probably write a book on that alone. Uh, one thing that starts happening is um, once, once that firm started raising money, because we had, we had clients on a subscription basis, but then we had clients that were, um, were managed funds. Mm -hmm. Um, but what happens is because it's the brokers raising those funds, the brokers are constantly calling you mm -hmm. and, and they're scared because they don't want you to lose their clients money. And so mm -hmm. what happens is they call and they're talking to you about all this negative stuff mm -hmm. and, and, uh, they become fearful if you allow them to get to you, and there were certainly cases where that happened, mm -hmm. um, and I've had nice compliments from trading desks that I'm I'm like a rock, mm -hmm. you know I'm like they'd say, wow you're just amazing, you know, 
you place your orders, you never call back and waver on your order or anything like that, because we were firing like 3,000 lots in the S&P. Mm. And, um, and uh, which at the time was 25% of the daily volume. Wow. So just insane. Um, and which is a whole nother story. Uh, that's the, the liquidity lecture, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the brokers would call and they'd get into your head. And so um, if you don't have the system to keep you on track, uh, to keep you following your rules, mm -hmm. then I would definitely say that um, without that um, in place, uh, the probability of a trader getting into a lot of trouble, including myself, um, because uh, when you've got 3,000 lots um, firing um, in the ES at 12.50 a tick, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you figured out, you know, one tick could be, you know, I mean, you know, you, 30 grand. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're sitting there, it's 30 grand tick. Mm -hmm. You know, sitting there looking at the screen. Oh, 30 grand tick. <laughs> okay. And then 20% of that's yours. So it's like, you know, six grand a tick is yours. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, you know, there's another temptation. Yeah. You should I book this? Mm -hmm. Should I book this trade with a small profit? You mm -hmm. know, or do I let it run into a hundred, uh, you know, hundred handle winner in the in the S and P? Mm -hmm. And um, that's what really attracted the capital to our system because we get caught in these hundred and hundred and fifty handle trades. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And and for, you know, so. Right. This is the kind of the kinds of things that come into play when you're doing this, um, and you just have to be emotionally like a rock, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which it doesn't feel like. Mm -hmm. you, you feel like you're off the rails, <laughs> yes. but you just got to go. No, I am not deviating. You know, I'm not deviating from my system. Um, and there were a couple of times that I uh, got those calls from the brokers and. And I didn't take a trade. And, of course, that turns into a monster trade mm -hmm. pretty much invariably. Mm -hmm. Because the more fearful the broker is, the more they're representing that you need to do the opposite. Right. I really started developing theories about you always have to do the opposite. Of, you know, I've told you this personally a mm -hmm. hundred times. You always have to do the opposite of what you feel. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a difference between how you feel in this instant and how you feel in a larger scale. And, and that can be confusing, too. But, mm. you know, how you feel on any time scale or any in any dimension um, and to be able to hold your course through thick or thin. You know, it's like that Rudyard Kipling poem about his son and, you know, go, basically being able to, uh, you know, hold his own when everything was against him. Let's get into some uh, technical things. Uh, for those who don't know, how long has the... Uh, uh, Robin's uh, World Cup Championship uh, been around? Oh, my goodness. Well back before 1986 or so. I was going to say about 30 years. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd have to Google how long they've been doing that. But, you know, the famous uh, case for uh, Robin's World Cup, of course, is the Larry Williams win. This is back, I think, 87 or it might have been 86. Or mm -hmm. That could be off a couple of years, but... Uh, he ran up an account um, to uh, 1.1 million uh, one year, starting mm -hmm. with 10,000. I think mm -hmm. that's really what put them on the map. Mm -hmm. Was not just that they were doing a trading contest, but that um, that there was was an occurrence of just outrageous performance. Big difference between trading uh, in a trading competition and managing money, however, very different. Did, so you won last year's uh, championship, or actually the 2013, right? Uh, I think it was 2008 or something. We had, uh, I had won that uh, using uh, E-mini Forecaster. All right. I got the trophy sitting up here. I'll go Yeah. look. Hold on a minute. I'll tell you what it is. Yeah, it was either 08 or 09. Um. Yeah, it's 2008, first mm -hmm. place, E-mini. Nice. And that was the uh, first time you ever participated in Robins? For, uh, 
first and only, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I like I said, there's a big difference between trading and a trading championship. You know, like uh, Larry Williams said, you know, in the interview. Um, oh yeah, I ran that account up to two, you know, two point two million, and then I had a million. <laughs> A million dollar drawdown <laughs> before the end of the thing because he's you're just going gung ho, right? Right. You got to go all out. You got to go all out, mm-hmm. and so it's do or die. And so, in in a lot of ways, um, winning a trading championship um, can be misunderstood because the the guys who win um, went all out and didn't get caught. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, this happens all the time in investing. Uh, you know, they show performance, uh, magazine or whatever, article with a money manager or something, and he's just on fire. Mm-hmm. And um, But what happens is there's an inverse relationship between the amount of assets that you have under management or in your account and the amount percentage-wise that you can make because you start chewing up the liquidity. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if I fire... Um, you know, if I fire a 2,000 lot into crude oil right now, um, it's going to disturb the market. Yes. And um, and it's not going, you know, if, if it's a long trade, to fire 2,000 lot to the long side in crude oil, it's going to create um, a big vacuum of, uh, of uh, orders. It's going to clear the order book. Mm-hmm. And it'll probably sit there and flop around and waffle about and create a what I call a liquidity vacuum where prices move back through that area up and down and mm-hmm. all this kind of thing. So what happens is as you get bigger and bigger, you have to become more and more skilled as to how you're placing your orders and this, this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's a little bit off topic, but but this is what happens, particularly somebody uh, trading in markets that are not particularly liquid. You know, say you're trading in soybeans or something like that in, mm-hmm. you know, December or something. And, so, um, yeah, basically entering when the markets are quieter. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so you have to, um, you have to be cautious. You know, th- then there are issues if you're a money manager or are you trading segregated individual accounts, in which case they all have to be filled, so you basically have to fire a market order. Or if you're trading pooled money, um in a case like that, you have the discretion to get a partial fill, mm-hmm. and so you can just keep firing limit orders and filling over time mm-hmm. if you've got pooled assets. Um, as I said, that's a little bit off topic, but but you know what I'm getting at is a, a lot of challenging things start coming up as you um, are trading larger and larger amounts of uh, capital. You have been uh, writing your own uh, systems uh, and. Uh indicators for a long time now um, what advice can you give to those who are either writing their own strategies or are looking to buy an automated strategy um, the single biggest piece of advice that I could give you is um, there's a <clears throat> I call it a paradigm but it's it's a a way of thinking um, is often often someone will say something to you and within the statement there are presuppositions about the nature of reality now that all sounds all esoteric or something but I'll I'll just clarify uh, what that means um, along about you know 95 or so uh, you know first trade station came out with uh, um, I think it was called easy charts or super charts mm-hmm. something like that and uh, that was my first copy of uh, trade station for example and being relatively new to the trading area the Im- imp- implied um, thing about that is that you can back test a system and it will work in the future mm-hmm. that's the that's the presupposition in in presenting trade station, you know, and that's what their ads say something like that, you know, back test before you trade. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem with back testing is if you're a little creative, 
and you're using the optimizer to just brute force through massive amounts of whatever, it would be almost impossible that you wouldn't find a good equity curve running a mass optimization. And so the first thing that I would say to somebody who was going out to develop a trading system is um, don't do that. Hmm. If there isn't some reason why your system should work, then it's probably not going to going forward. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean why? And what does this have to do with backtesting? Um, markets are constantly in alternation. It changes up constantly. You, you get similar kinds of rough sketches of a pattern, but it's never exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's always a little different. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way something sets up or, you know, the way a, a good trade um, has to be managed or this, this kind of thing, always a little different. And so that presents a huge challenge because as you get tighter and tighter rule sets within the framework of a trading system, the probability of it working in the future is, is uh, lower and lower. And the very best systems are almost invariably, and you know this too because we had just a tremendous amount of success with the system that, uh, that we did together, um, but, uh, but you know as well as I do that that was four lines of code. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you could call it six. There's, there's a, a line of code to buy, there's a line of code to sell. Mm -hmm. There's a line of code for the uh, stop uh, on the long side, and there's a line of code for the stop on the short side. And then maybe you've got some kind of a trailing money management kind of uh, thing in there. There's two more lines of code. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it, it might look like a few more than that, but generally speaking, a good system is two lines of code. Mm -hmm. That well, Crazy as that seems, is two lines of code. And it's not trying to over-optimize or, uh, or uh, get too tight of a uh, of a criteria because the probability that those are going to happen in the future uh, is slim, and you just filter yourself out of all the trades. And, but even worse yet, you filter yourself into an equity curve. If if it's not based on something that works, you filter yourself out of an equity curve that's going to be successful in the future. So, mm -hmm. number one, it has to be simplicity. Now, let me give you an example of a, just completely throwing out the idea of backtesting, period, mm -hmm. um, and, and running optimizers and then trying to see if your optimization is statistically significant. There's a, there's a uh, technique, there are statistical techniques you can use, chi-square, or um, uh, basically what you do is you run statistical analysis on your equity curves from all the optimizations. You run all these optimizations and then you run statistical analysis to see if there's a statistical difference between the worst one and the best one. Mm -hmm. If you follow me on that. Right. So I got this one equity curve that's just like all over the place, you know, because the very best system is going to have a relatively smooth equity curve. Mm -hmm. Just nice and smooth. They don't, good equity curves don't go like this right. all, all over the place. Um, and so, um, you, uh, anyway, so, um, um, what I do these days for system development is I don't try to create that optimization and I don't compare equity curves, um, because I only will build a system these days if it's based on something that I know is statistically valid. Um, I'll give you a I'll give you an example of this. Um, in crude oil, I'll just use crude oil because I trade that daily. In crude oil, um, I know that we're going to move um, right now 85 ticks off the open mm -hmm. every day. That's I the mean, range. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, that that's actually an extension off the open. That's oh, different. in one direction. In one direction. Yeah, we call that stretcher. Mm -hmm. Just um, Toby Crable called called the lesser um, of the open and the high, or the open and the low. Mm -hmm. He called that the stretch. Okay. So you know, you open here, you come down, and then you come back through it, and you go up, for example, and, and you have a range expansion from there. Mm -hmm. We call the small part. Of from the open to the stretch. That's what Toby Crable called it. Mm -hmm. And then we call the large one above that, if it's going up, mm -hmm. the stretcher. I see. Um, I know that's going uh, 85 ticks. So no, I, I know a bunch of these stats for all different times of day and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just know them on the top of my head. Um, I'll, you do these things in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So you, you get in a spreadsheet with the data and you start, you know, mining for little golden nuggets. Uh -huh. So you go, okay, I know that we go 85 ticks uh, off of the open every day. So here's my question. At what point do I know that there's a 68% or 95% probability, one and two standard deviations mm -hmm. above the mean? At what point do I know that the low is not going to be retagged? Mm -hmm. Well, it's 43 ticks. And I'm talking right now. It's 43 ticks. So once I go 43 ticks, there's a 95% probability that I'm not going back the other way. And how many ticks are left? Another 40. 42. Mm -hmm. There's 42 ticks left. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that means that um, if I can manage to get a well-placed trade in there, I've got 42 ticks of uh, of range with about a 90 or 87 percent probability or something like mm -hmm. that. So, the component number one of my system. Okay, let's just call that a system. Mm -hmm. All right, we've gone 43 ticks. Uh, there's a huge. There's 87 percent probability we're going 42. More. All right. Um, another thing I know is in crude oil that the overnight high or low is going to get hit um, about 95% of the time. Well, question is, uh, how far away is that? Is that more than 42 ticks? Is it less than 42 ticks? You know. Mm -hmm. Okay, component number two, throw that into the pile. Mm -hmm. right? it just keep doing this, mm -hmm. all right? Keep doing this. You have five, six, seven of these stats lined up, and they're all saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, what do I know that markets do? I know that they zigzag, so they go A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. you know, E, F, G, whatever. whatever. Mm -hmm. This is what markets do. And uh, so um, what's a reasonable strategy for trying to take advantage of that 80-some-odd percent probability that I'm going to hit a certain number? And then uh, I trade that. Now, the very, very, very best systems in the world ever devised are like this. And the more of these components that you can pile together to make the system, it's, it, then it becomes like a decision table. You've got, you got one through nine, let's say. You've got nine of these things. Mm -hmm. if, if you get to 15, you've got the holy grail. Mm -hmm. It's just like a... Because you've got... Each one of these is basically like one, two lines of code. Mm -hmm. It says, if I go 43 ticks, I'm going 87. The question is, where's the uh, entry where I can manage my risk in order to exploit the other 42? And the other one is, how much risk do I have to make in comparison to the 42? Mm -hmm. And is that a reasonable risk for what I'm trying to get? Mm -hmm. So if it was like 15 ticks of risk to get the 42 with a 87%, mm -hmm. Then I can just off the top of my head. I know I know I got a good system, but the beautiful thing is the system's alive, and it's changing every day. I got the stat on my screen. I just look over at my screen and I see what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. I just make a chart that's not a trading system, but it tells me this information for that particular component. So, so you update these stats every day? Yeah, they're just like you know they just uh, look like a uh, a histogram or. Mm -hmm. 
uh, of the ranges. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other things that we know um, uh, in line with this. So what I'm saying is, let's say you got nine of these things, and um, uh, five of them are true. Mm -hmm. You have five of them are lined up. Well, you best be looking for a way to get long. Mm -hmm. You know, and tag that you know four hundred dollar per contract uh, gain for the day this is the way that systems um, ideally work mm -hmm. and this is a this is also uh, what else is happening here in what I'm describing is you can't look at a chart and know what I'm describing it's not on the chart mm -hmm. because it's data over over many days you know stat like you know the two stats that I just described. You know, have a year a year's worth of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know these are really strong tendencies, and so, um, and so you align yourself to exploit those things, and that's what a, that's the way I develop systems these days. But each one of them is an extremely simple two-line system that just basically says, if A, then B, um, and and you stack up about nine of these, and if five of them are true, you go. Gotcha. And, and so that's that's how the best systems are done. I'm not saying that there's that back testing isn't good. You know, some of the best systems I ever developed uh, definitely involve back testing. But the problem with back testing is the market's constantly changing. We've over the last number of years transitioned really into a world market. It used to be U.S. markets didn't give a hoot what was happening overseas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now a little news comes out of China, and uh, you know the S and P's down 65 on the open. Yes. You know, this is not the same uh, game that we were playing a couple of years ago, and um, and so these companies are con that make up the S and P. Just using that as an example, um, are constantly these are brilliant people constantly repositioning themselves to benefit from what they perceive the market situation to be, right? And so the market's going to constantly change to reflect the brilliance of these CEOs who know what's happening in their markets and are trying to do their very best to, um, to stay on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the S&P, for example, being a weighted uh, index, in other words, it waits to the um, the bigger companies. So it waits to the more powerful companies. Mm -hmm. In fact, about the top five in the S and P probably account for about ninety five percent of its price action. Mm. Wow! You know that that applies to stock indexes. Of course, that wouldn't apply to a currency. Or something like that, so. so you currently trade uh, uh, oil futures, and um, I know that you also have um, <coughs> bonds. Uh, uh, trading program. Yes, our uh, bond pro uh, program is designed exactly like what I just described, mm -hmm. and it's hard coded. It's pulling all kinds of data, mm -hmm. and it positions itself uh, according to these simple systems lining up. And there's and no getting, there's no variables. There's nothing to optimize. No, there are currently eleven components in the, in the system. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing in crude oil, but we do it in a more discretionary manner. We know that certain ranges are going to be hit. Um, you know, like for example, today in crude oil, um, we knew that today's the 13th of um, January. Um, we knew that there's an 87% probability it was going to extend. Um, set, uh, yeah, 85% that it's going to extend 65 ticks down um, from the midday high. Hmm. Just a stat we know. Mm -hmm. And you break down it, the day into uh, blocks of time? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you break it down into blocks. There's all different ways that you can kind of partition it out and start looking for these stats. This is the stuff that, that we teach, mm -hmm. in both implicitly and explicitly in the oil trading room. And so that, that's kind of an environment where um, people can come in and, and start to learn some of these concepts, start playing around with spreadsheets and picking some of these things up from uh, guys in there that know how to do this stuff. So um, I have a belief that for 
anybody who's trying to trade or start a business uh, it comes down to three components as far as um, how much time and energy people spend on and for me it's uh, knowledge strategy and execution and I think that a lot of people spend most of their time and energy on the strategy uh, before they know everything they need to know and uh, so but then their strategy suffers because they don't have the proper knowledge therefore exactly. their execution is going to be poor as well yeah another thing that happens with a lot of people is um, a, a lot of people that are drawn to this uh, stuff are, are really smart people and uh, they may have had a good deal of success um, in other areas before they got here. So, a uh, highly competent engineer, doctor, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people who own their own companies come in um, and these sorts of things. And so, another uh, area that I see this kind of thing happening, that what you're describing, is they've, they've had just nonstop competence in their life. And they step into this trading arena and they don't, they somehow miss the idea that of just how much learning you need to go through before, mm -hmm. before you can get competent. Right. And there's a lot of little subtle areas of competency. Mm -hmm. You know, when, like I said, I, I was talking earlier about, you know, getting something executed. Getting something executed can be a big deal, mm -hmm. you know. And, and you, you don't want to just click the market button. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it might be okay in some cases, but but uh, you're really. I, I kind of had a. I was kind of imagining it this morning. It's like. It's like there's this little river, and, and it's kind of more like a creek, and you know there's there's forty thousand people that want to drink, mm -hmm. and. You're trying to get down to the river to dip your little ladle in there and, and get some water, mm -hmm. but there's a shortage of the of the stuff and and there's forty thousand guys that are trying to keep you from you know or even taking your ladle away from you. Mm -hmm. right? So um, the trading's kind of like this, and it doesn't look like that on the screen. It all seems just kind of friendly, but. Um, and and the thing is, you look at a chart, and there's these you know big huge ranges all over the place, and and, um, and you'd ask yourself after a while, why can't I just exploit? You know, I mean, it, you know, if you've been doing this for a while, you start asking yourself, man, why can't I even take a point out of this thing? Uh -huh. and just call it a you know, if I could just trade a ten lot for a point, man, <laughs> I you know that I'd be making you know three fifty a year right. and you know it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. it's different every time everything's different you know and so you got to be really smart and and then at the same time when it comes to execution you can't be all that smart because if you're too smart when you're executing you're too rational mm -hmm. and you don't pay attention to because uh, it's your unconscious mind that ultimately helps you to be a good trader not the this is what I was saying the brokers call up on the phone you may have a system you know you got uh, rules and everything that you follow, right? But it's ultimately going to come down to you being a solid um, uh, person, uh, you know, in your uh, in your alignment between your conscious and your unconscious mind. If those two things aren't in alignment, uh, you got problems. Yes. You you won't be able to execute the system. Uh, you'll make the wrong decisions at the wrong time. You'll look back at it after the fact and you'll go, "Okay, I knew that." I'm, ne I'm never going to do that again, and you just keep repeating the same behavioral patterns over and over again. I call it alignment, mm -hmm. and there's a big deal about alignment between, you know, if, like you said, uh, what would you say, uh, knowledge, strategy, and execution. Right? Yes. Yeah, so um, if you uh, have the, the knowledge um, and you bring it into the strategy, okay, mm -hmm. so it's like, okay, I I know a real lot about shoes, man. So I'm going to open a shoe store, mm -hmm. all right? And man, people are just going to come in. They're going to want to buy my shoes, okay? And so you know you're thinking like this all rationally and everything, and and you get in there. You get in there, and you, um, you, uh, 
you know, the customers start coming in and stuff, but your heart's not really in it. Mm. In other words, you're not aligned. Mm. You know, you, you were thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to make money, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever just decides to make money and be successful just for the sake of making money. There has to, there's some passion behind it that drives it so that when people come in the store, they feel that energy mm -hmm. and, and they connect with what your message is and why you're doing what you're doing. You know, why, you know, we're, we're the shoe store that, uh, you know, we really take care of our customers, you know, or, or whatever. There's some message in there about why you're doing what you're doing that brings you into alignment with your purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for a trader. Uh, you know when you go into a store and the and the owner uh, loves what they do. Yes, they're there to help. They're there to help you and and so you go, wow, man, yeah, I paid a couple extra dollars, you know, to do business with this guy low in my local economy here, but but man, he really uh, got me online for what I wanted, man, and I, I feel good about my purchase, and I know that this, you know, these shoes aren't going to mess up my feet. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm running forty miles a week or whatever, and you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, trading is the same thing. You have to be in alignment with yourself because you are the entire reality when you're trading. Mm. You're the entire reality. You might think it's something out there. You, you know, you're thinking, oh, there's this market out there, but no, no, it's all going, it's all in here. It's, mm -hmm. it's just a bunch of zig, you know, zigzaggy things on your screen or whatever, and um, and it's 100% internal game. So. Uh, you have to take 100% responsibility for yourself uh, while you're trading mm -hmm. and uh, for the decisions that you're making. Because if you don't, you'll blame it on someone else and you won't learn the lessons that you need to learn. And the lessons that you learn in trading are absolutely profound. That's why I said earlier, I, you know, I hate to use the word spiritual, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like trading and spirituality, you know. What are you talking about, Rob? <laughs> But what happens is, with this whole alignment issue with yourself, if you take 100% responsibility and start taking a good hard look in the mirror as to why you're not doing something right, um, it's really a wonderful uh, arena for personal development. Mm. Right, really because is. if you don't take personal responsibility for your trades or the outcomes, then you're not going to learn the necessary lessons. Yeah, and, and those the little subtleties that make the difference, the difference between being profitable and just totally losing it, mm -hmm. are so fine. Mm -hmm. It's not just alignment of yourself, being in alignment with your purpose and everything else. It's alignment on your charts. Mm -hmm. Is this the right time? Mm -hmm. You know, is this the right time? Well, speaking of charts, let's um, talk about uh, some of the technical details since... Uh, I don't know any trader um, today that doesn't look at charts. Um, I don't even, th you trade oil every day. I don't think you even look at fundamentals. Is that correct? No, I don't give a hoot what they are. And, you know, the thing is, and you know this, we've talked about this a hundred times. The, um, you know, the report will come out and it's good. There's an old saying in the market, and it applies to anything buy the rumor, sell the news. Mm -hmm. If the market rallies into a report, sell it yes okay if it tanks into the report after the report you can buy it. Mm -hmm. and so this is a kind of a generalized tendency but notice that my saying uh, uh, completely ignores what that actual data is mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter right because if it went up going into the report then they were factoring in the positive news. Yeah, right. because markets anticipate. Yeah, that's what it's they already, do, and they're good at it. Price already you know? tells you everything you need to know. Exactly, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> so um, let's talk about some details um, on um, chart uh, price charts. Uh, so um, people use, uh, let's say, they're using uh, time-based uh, charts, like I think ninety percent of traders do, and they are drawing uh you know trend lines let's say it's a trend or a trend channel now uh there's a lot of uh arguments back and forth between uh, drawing those uh, trend lines through the highs and lows versus the bodies of a candle closes or opens well mostly closes i would think um can you shed any light on that argument 
um, when I, when I first started trading, um, the guy that I took on as a mentor taught me how to trade with trend lines. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, it was it was his whole deal. Mm -hmm. um, there are, are a lot of pitfalls um, that you can get into with trend lines in general. Mm -hmm. um, first, the first problem and foremost is that um, everybody knows they're there. Mm -hmm. Anybody can just look at it and see it. You don't even have to draw it. You can just kind of visually see that there's a tendency there. Mm -hmm. The one from the the center that you're talking about is more like a linear regression channel. Um, a linear regression will, it's a fancy way of saying the line of best fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, over a different thing, it'll it'll take the highs and the lows or the closes, and it'll it'll compute mm -hmm. um, by taking the square roots of the differences away from the line. Mm -hmm until it finds a line of best fit. Mm -hmm. It's called a regression channel. It's probably one in your software package. Mm -hmm. That's like getting it through the closes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the trend line itself is often done off of highs or lows. Um, and so you'll tend to draw it along the lows going up and you're looking for a cross mm -hmm. or you'll draw it along the um, the highs going down and looking for a cross. Mm -hmm. um, these days, um, my guess would be, because I haven't really done that kind of thing for many years, but, um, well, again, if, if you were working with trend lines, one of the things I would say is, is this a let's say you've got a market that's just going down, 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 down without any significant retracements. Mm -hmm. And you've got a line going across the top of that. Mm -hmm. One pattern I might look for is for it to break out to the upside and then fail mm -hmm. and then come back through again. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to get is going to come down, 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 down. It's going to come through the trend line. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to retest it. That's the dumb money. <laughs> All right. The, okay. the early adopters. Then, then it's going to come down. It's going to test out a new low mm -hmm. on a shorter cycle. Mm -hmm. So so you're going to get this, this channel kind of thing going down, and then, bam, hits all the stops. Mm -hmm. Find some place to buy it when it's coming back through that time, not the first one. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and, and the opposite for coming down. Now, um... You could use a regression going the same way, but there's two, well, there's actually three environments where you're doing this, and I, I would urge you to discern which of these environments you're in. Number one, uh, it, could, it could go zigzag down, mm -hmm. zigzag, zigzag down, okay? And you're drawing along these highs. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a break on that and you're going to buy it, you should probably be selling it, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's very different from what we just described, down, 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 and those zigzags. Right. And you're not along those highs. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd look for that to break again um, because you're at the high. Mm -hmm. Why, you know, you don't, probably don't want to buy a high. Okay. And so those are two different situations the other situation is that the market's more random and your line is more flattened out mm -hmm. or, or channel like mm -hmm. okay and so i would urge you to be aware of each of those three conditions mm -hmm. so in answer to your question after saying all those things i don't believe that any one of those techniques might be better than the other mm -hmm. probably uh, the nice thing about the linear re regression is it's testable because you ask 10 guys to draw a trend line, you get 10 different trend lines. Mm. You know, you might have specific, very hard rule sets for how you draw a trend line. Uh, I used to work a lot on, you know, okay, exactly. Do you, do you draw the trend line touching the highs? Mm -hmm. Do you draw the trend line just a hair above the highs? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, do you draw the trend line kind of inside? If you get one that breaks, do you readjust the trend line and flatten out the angle of it? Mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? Yep. Or or do I look for that to retest and break again? Mm -hmm. um, there's a strategy called a wolf wave. Mm. You could probably look it up on the internet or come up on an Investopedia or something like that. A wolf wave is a form of what I had described. Mm. Uh, I've seen guys that had coded these kinds of things, and I'd done a lot of work with these kinds of things years ago, coding them. Um, you look for the break and then the and then the the rebreak. Mm -hmm. um, I was never able to make that profitable for myself. Mm -hmm. For myself. Now, let me throw this another light on on this. That's interesting, since I know that you have an interest in currencies. Um, and that is the idea of managed futures. Mm -hmm. What is managed futures? It's a, it's a loose term that people throw around. Here's, here's what you do. You create a portfolio of simple trading systems. Mm -hmm. Hey, ring a bell. <laughs> a portfolio of simple trading systems. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and basically, it's like a moving average. It's like, okay, it has some long-term moving average, a one-month moving average. All right. And I'm looking out for a year, 12 months. The 12 period moving average on a monthly chart or something, mm -hmm. right? Buy when it breaks. Oh, yeah, I don't care if it's going to retrace because I'm looking at the big picture. Mm -hmm. so, so you got a moving average on 12 months and, and it breaks and you take the trade. But you do it across, you know, a dozen instruments. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to happen is. And I've, I've, I've looked at this with all, and, and I've read white papers that support this as a, as a very viable method. Because mm -hmm. I've already told you it's a highly viable method within one market. It's certainly viable across multiple markets. And I'm going I'm to tell you how it plays out. Um, if you do that in futures, uh, you're going to get caught in a couple of gargantuan moves in a couple of markets each year. Mm -hmm. Gargantuan, you know. Right. Markets that just, you know, it's like crude oil, you know, move from 118 down to $30 a mm -hmm. month. So you would have been short crude oil from, you know, 112. Mm -hmm. You're still short. Something like that. I'm just making it up. Right. right. Uh, so you got caught in a, hey, we got caught in a big one in crude oil this year. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's $1,000 a point. So, you know, yeah, we're up, uh, you know, we're up 12 grand on that one per contract or whatever. So... Um, a couple of markets are going to take off. You're going to get caught in some really big ones. And the other one's going to waffle back and forth sideways. Mm -hmm. And uh, on average, you return about 12 to 15% a year with 15% drawdowns. Mm -hmm. Now, that's nothing to write home about. But uh, a lot of money managers have become billion-dollar funds doing what I just described. Mm -hmm. It's called managed futures. And so now uh, another uh, kind of twist on that is uh, you take asset classes that uh, pay dividends mm -hmm. that are high yield. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of cool. Uh, utilities, uh, real estate investment trusts. Oil companies. Uh, well, MEPs, right? Um, uh, I forget what it's called, right? You know. Uh, they're pipeline lease companies, mm -hmm. AI dividends, um, these sorts of things. And you build a portfolio of those kinds of asset classes. What's nice about those is you're receiving the dividends and trying to catch the big moves. Yes. And so now when you get market meltdowns like what we might be going through right now, mm -hmm. there's like right now there's virtually no ships in the Atlantic Ocean transferring goods mm -hmm. across that ocean. That's never happened before. That's going on right now as we speak. So uh, we're kind of in a unique world situation right now. Things are slowing down, you know. Mm -hmm. The uh, Federal Reserve can't manipulate interest rates any longer, this, this sort of thing. I don't so know, Rob. I, I took a video of uh, Jim Cramer saying to buy stocks two weeks ago. So, Well, if Jim said it, then, I mean... Don't sell bear, whatever you do. <laughs> bear turns is fine. <laughs> yeah, bears. So, uh, but but what I'm saying is, um, that's one way to 
uh, to trade. And if, if you're interested in currencies, this idea um, kind of doesn't really work because if you look at the the universe of currencies, they all represent they all represent one pool of money that's just going mm-hmm. every which way. Right. See? And so, but if you kind of give that a lean towards the currencies that are paying the higher interest rates, because mm-hmm. money t- tends to move towards high interest rates because mm-hmm. people want to get paid the government interest because it's relatively stable. So if you're doing it on countries that have stable governments and mm-hmm. you know uh, and they're paying any kind of interest, then you move the money towards the higher interest rate, and then you might also get the appreciation and the movement. Yeah. So it's a strategy kind of like that. Right. Um, but the reason I brought that up is because you brought up a trend line, and, mm-hmm. and I converted that second idea you had into regression channels. Mm-hmm. You can uh, create portfolios of that kind of thing and actually uh, get an edge uh, doing that. Mm. But you're probably going to be a little longer time frame than right. you know, bigger picture kind of stuff. Yeah, it's always nice to trade with the big picture trend. Oh, yeah, because you get caught in those big ones and they feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, we could talk on uh, one interview uh, one day about the basic profile between the three different system types. You've got um, breakout systems. Mm-hmm. You've got uh, counter trend systems. A counter trend system is where you sell new highs and you buy new lows. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you've got um, trend systems. And then you've got hybrid systems where you're buying in a trend but on a pullback. Mm-hmm those kinds of things Mm -hmm. I mean yeah I mean trend trading you want to buy on pullbacks right because otherwise well that's that's a preferred thing because you line things up a little bit better in your favor if you Mm. do that now each of those has a different statistical profile associated with it Mm. and the reason that that's important is because you may or may not be suited to a trend system because trend systems could win only 30% of the time but you get caught in these giant winners that we're talking about yeah, a lot of currencies trade for the longest time you know yeah uh, right let's just keep going um, yeah like for me in an in a trading format where it's not automated mm-hmm. i want bim bam boom now right i want some action mm-hmm. give me i'm i'm taking the ferrari please mm-hmm. okay i'm not a um you know i i don't want to get in a trade and just sit there mm-hmm I don't want to use a giant stop and have it flop around. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm looking for movement away from my entry now. Mm-hmm. And the way, the best way to do that is to trend trade, but to go into a more micro um, environment. And then I find that uh, if you align the order flow itself with the momentum of the price, then you can often get caught in trades that are moving away from you and uh, minimize your risk. Mm-hmm. And so, Reading though, the yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so that's my personal way of trading. But I know guys that will go, um, yeah, Rob, I know that uh, that 85 ticks is up there and I'm just going to use a 25 tick stop. And, you know. Just jump on it. Seven out of ten days he's going to, grab it without getting stopped out Mm -hmm. you know um patient as can be but if i got to sit there um personally i know that that doesn't uh, work as well for me i might catch that trade but i might break it into pieces something you said a long time ago to me um the fact that you never see uh, comedians do a cover of another comedian in other words like teaching somebody how to trade it may not fit their style at all right and even if you're you know profitable trader they might be a total loser well when when a a comedian is really going to be funny he's usually talking about himself Mm -hmm. you know right and you can't make that stuff up yeah right (laughs) you you know what (laughs) right now with the exception of larry the cable guy that's an entire act he 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 doesn't really talk about (laughs) things you know He's from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> he made up the character. Right, it's brilliant. right. It's all fake. But, 
Yeah, it's, but well, it, it, no, it's real because he's <laughs> he he just knows how because a good actor can do that, right? right? But for most people, they're they're being themselves. You know, is it? And this is what we were talking about with alignment and everything else. You know. What about traders um, looking and trading off of uh, support and resistance levels? Do they really exist, or we're only seeing when they exist and we're avoiding? We're not seeing all the times they don't. They're not there. Uh, support. Yeah, support and resistant levels uh, definitely work, and that is uh, ultimately a counter trend kind of method, mm -hmm. uh, at least on the forefront of it. Mm -hmm. uh, market profile. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because a huge population of traders trade market profile, 30-minute charts. Mm -hmm. Huge. So if if you're trading, you know, I might not be a market profile trader, but you can you can bet I've got that chart up there because I know those people have a huge impact. They're looking at it. Yeah, you bet, man. So um, is uh, market profile going to lose its edge What if there is an edge you know, when enough people look at it? Well, uh, I'm, I'm actually looking at it from an entirely different perspective. Um, the If, if we, op like in crude oil today, we opened above value. Mm-hmm. Okay, we open above value. The textbook trade for open above value is to buy the value area high. So, uh, for those who don't know, you've got this band of price, and you got three possibilities: you open above it, you open inside, or you open below. Mm -hmm. If it opens above, the tendency is going to be to come back down and touch the upper part of it, and then go away. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you open below, you come touch it again, and you go away. If you're inside, then they're going to try and play coast-to-coast -coast moves. Coast-to-coast mm -hmm. -coast is in inside. So I open like right here. I go down, I touch this. I come up, I touch this. Mm -hmm. I turn back around, I touch that. And it goes back and forth all day. Mm -hmm. That system that we did together that was so successful, that's what that system would do. It just it'd play pinball. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, it would it would the code would allow it to break out. Mm -hmm. Two lines of code. Yeah, it was based it, on it, previous it, day's close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and they just waffle about in there. And some day, some day, I remember one day the thing flipped back and forth like twenty times and made thousand uh, dollars in the ES on a one line. Yes, mm -hmm. eighteen trades or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, crazy, right? Um, who would have thunk it? But but uh, and then it breaks out and it gets caught in this runner trade that goes for three mm -hmm. days. You know. Anyways, uh, the. Um, um, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> the market profile. Oh, market profile is a similar thing. You've got these bands, right? You're you either you're opening in it or you're opening outside of it. And so now, when when I coded that originally, I wasn't thinking like market profile, but that's basically how how th that group of traders trades. And so, one thing that I uh, find valuable is to know how different kinds of traders trade. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if we open uh, in a scenario where I just like what I just described, there's probably also a gap on the chart. Mm -hmm. Well, gap traders like to fade back to the uh, closing of the gap. Mm -hmm. So when you gap up and you're out of value, um, then you've got two groups going in opposite directions. The first groups, the first group's going to come down and try and fade away from that high, and if that gap is down below, that second group is trying to go so at one point they're going together mm -hmm. and then at another point they're going in opposite direction so i'm sitting there looking at the screen and i think i'm gonna think this all day okay what is each group doing mm -hmm. is there unfinished business is is another way that i put it to myself yeah there's unfinished business we haven't uh, we left a gap on the chart mm -hmm. there's all kinds of these gaps like on a market profile there's a type of gap that we call an anomaly if you have, if you break the day down into uh, periods, just A, B, C period, each one being 30 minutes mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. If if you go up A, up in A, and then up in B, and then you have C starts up here, right? Mm -hmm. If C doesn't co come down and touch the A high, mm -hmm. then it will leave a hole on the profile. Mm -hmm. Well, market profile traders don't like that. Mm -hmm. So they'll they'll trade it back down to the A high. Well, what is that for a trend trader? It's it's that buying pullbacks. in the dips. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're buying in the pullbacks. Mm -hmm. See, 
And so if you don't know that the this huge population of traders wants to take it back to the A high and you keep fading it mm -hmm. before you get there, mm -hmm. you're not patient and you keep fading it before you get there. Mm -hmm. You know, so that uh, there's another system I just threw into the pile of, of systems. Right. It's like, okay, well, you know, if if these conditions are true, then wait for them to pull it back to the A high and I'm going to trade it out for that 80, 82 ticks, which is now was going to be uh, 40 uh, 42 ticks, I'm sorry. It was going to be 42 ticks, but now because it retraced so deeply, it's going to be 65. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. I got 87% to 65 ticks. Mm -hmm. You know. So do you set uh, targets there at those statistical levels, or do you trail? Um, you can handle it a couple of different ways. For example, like uh, another one is the daily median range. Mm -hmm. So if the range is hit, right now um, a lot of times on a lot of days that's kind of a game changer for because smart money knows that you've already gone the median range mm -hmm. and so what will happen is the market will start chopping now dumb money will wait to hit the median range they'll go oh, yeah it's an up market today mm -hmm. well yeah but you didn't know that it's a 95 percent up market at at 42 ticks mm -hmm. right that you waited till 85 well guess what it's over <laughs> it's over baby <laughs> you know and bam 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 stop 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 you know next thing next thing the guy knows he's waited so do you look at both median and average range yeah but the medians uh the medians king hmm. yeah medians king yeah but not a lot of people look at the medians <laughs> what? That's why. How many? How the more people looking at it. The more people trading on five minute charts, the tougher it's going to be to trade on a five minute chart. Yeah. The more people trading on hour charts, the tougher it's going to be to trade on hour charts. Um, so, how many days back do you look for uh, median and average? Uh, five. Five days. Yeah, I told you this the other day. Hmm. Five days. Hmm. Uh, so. We're not going to go uh, too deep into the next topic, but I wanted to talk about, um, um, you know, everybody talks about having an edge, um, but I think that, um, you know, you have a pretty good edge, I think, with the bars that you developed. Um, now, what kind of advice can you give to uh, traders about developing their own edge and not looking to copy someone else's edge? Well, there's two things. I'll draw one from something we talked about earlier. One is um, what you are doing as a trader has to have some basis in reality. Mm -hmm. There has to be a reason why why this is happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's got to be a reason why it's trying to go up. You're not just going up for no reason. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants it up and they're willing to pay higher prices to, to take it there. So um, so if you can have some kind of an edge by aligning yourself with something that statistically I use statistic as an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I use going to a median range or going to a, a certain kind of target level. Um that is one form of of getting an edge and like i said the reason that that stuff works is because 95 percent of all the traders only see what's on their screen mm -hmm. but these stats are made of composites of large amounts of data mm -hmm. and we know what's we know what the deviance uh deviation is on them and things like this mm -hmm. so um it's probably you're probably not going to find an edge by looking at a chart mm -hmm. you know and so you try to find things that are in alignment with reality mm -hmm. so I, don't, I know maybe that sounds like a funny phrase they're based but in reality it's based in reality mm -hmm. and now there's another reason why you want to do that um, if I make a trading decision and I end up losing on it and I don't know what probability was associated with the um, with that I might be successful for a time that's fine I'm not knocking it one way or the other but and you might just be happy-go-lucky 
I mean, I've seen guys that just got good karma or whatever, and they just can kill it trading. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you can't do anything wrong. Um, but uh, but some people uh, actually have to earn earn it. You know, and so um, you uh, you dig into some data. And you find patterns that work. So uh, there, there are price patterns that work. When I talk about price patterns, I talk about like price action. Mm -hmm. Okay, market goes A, B, C, D up, and then does a retracement, and um, and the momentum associated with that is an expanding cycle. Mm -hmm. That's that what I just described. There is worth its weight in gold. Okay, because a most people can't see an expanding cycle uh, by looking at a chart. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there are ways of identifying an expanding cycle before you can see it. So this is an example of a, a of an edge. You can't really see it by looking at the chart, but the cycle's expanding. So what does that mean? Okay, if if the market's going up and down in a tight range, then what do we know about the cycle? It's really short. Mm -hmm really short. Mm -hmm. Chop, 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 chop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Might be, you know, so this is a one minute chart. Uh -huh. Might have a might have a four minute cycle. Right. Okay. Then what then what happens is this thing starts breaking and going. Cycle length gets longer. You know, five, seven, mm -hmm. twelve minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. So the cycle's getting uh, bigger, um, and that is highly indicative of trend continuation. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I learned back in uh, in the early years in '93. Uh, um, I started playing around with uh, uh, Fourier analysis, um, playing around with maximum entropy mm -hmm. method. Basically, what these things do is they they use mathematical methods to attempt to identify what the cycle length is, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, what I found out is that um, expanding cycle length is highly indicative of trend continuation, and if you put it if you lay that into the kind of context that we're talking about with the ranges mm -hmm. and the market profile levels and these other mm -hmm. uh, these other things if if you lay those together then you start piling edges on top of each other mm -hmm. but my number one m uh, method for making a trend decision is expanding cycle mm -hmm. and then that's laid into the other higher context so that because um, you can try to trade on um, on knowledge of the range expansion itself, but that won't get you good trade placement. Hmm. Good trade placement comes with getting the dip in the expanding cycle. Mm -hmm. right. And like I said, you can't see that on a chart. Hmm. Um, generally speaking, this is why I don't use time-based charts. Right, I was going to say, probably easier to see it on uh, volume-based. Uh, yeah, tick-oriented kinds of charts, uh, net volume oriented kinds of chart mm -hmm. uh, and range charts mm -hmm. range range charts are quite good so is opposite true uh, if you are in the trend and uh, the cycles are contracting would that be the end of the trend yeah mm -hmm. yeah it is um, if I get caught um, if I get caught in a really abrupt move and it chops and uh, fails to go higher Mm -hmm. Um you know here here's an example of that right here. So you go A B C mm -hmm. all right. It it's double topping. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting this one, two, three, four, five we call them railroad ties. Mm -hmm. Right. Five railroad ties. Um, and um, that's a contracting and then it fails. cycle there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and and we knew uh, we knew from uh, this high right here. You see, I've got this this um, rule around here. Mm -hmm. I'm taking it off of this high right here. Mm -hmm. I know from the E period. Mm -hmm. That's a tiny little E right there. Mm -hmm. I know from the E period that I'm going to go 65 ticks. 87% of the time and I know I'm gonna go um, 70 ticks like 80% um, of the time and so I knew I knew that I was coming somewhere down into here mm -hmm. into this region of the chart which is and that was uh, near the low of the day mm -hmm. and so uh, that was an example of laying a um, laying um, the movement into a statistic uh -huh. yeah this this tool right here will tell you that you've got expanding um, expanding cycle going away from this point up here mm -hmm. this is that same uh, high that we were just talking mm -hmm. about when this when this uh, momentum uh, goes higher while well, this is lower mm-hmm it's telling me that the cycle is expanding. Mm -hmm. And so this line right here is the midpoint of the day. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get positioned uh, somewhere just below the midpoint of the day, there's a good chance that your position is protected, I call it. Mm -hmm. That the market's not going to go back up through that. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get yourself positioned in here and you've got the intestinal fortitude to do it, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you know it's going 65 lower off of that high up there. Mm -hmm. It's at 95. You know it's going to 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, with an 87 and a half percent. So you hop on that at 74 for a 44 tick run, and for hell or high water, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you sit through all this stuff yeah. until you get down to 30. And your stop can be just about the midpoint. Yeah, and you asked me, uh, you asked me, well, do you get out at the range target? You know, this is a form of a range target. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you get out down here at 30? Well, you know, when it starts waffling about, mm -hmm. you know, get out. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you know, you end up sitting through this thing from there all the way down mm -hmm. to up right there. Can you move the chart a little bit to the left more? Sure. And then just scroll a little bit more. I mean, I can scrunch this up a little bit more so you can kind of see the whole mm -hmm. picture. Yeah. So you're you're starting at this high, and then it comes back up and it triple tops here. Mm -hmm. You make a cycle down to a new low. You recycle. The cycle length's expanding. And you know all the stats. You know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, now, for me, I might catch that first run. That green line right there is uh, yesterday's close mm -hmm. down to there. Yesterday's close was a huge thing today. Uh, you know, I'll I'll trade this down into here and I'll hop out. Mm -hmm. Then I'll end up uh, I'll end up you know going out for breakfast or whatever. And I I didn't catch that. I knew I knew there's a good probability it was going there. Mm -hmm. But this this whole region of the chart um, is emotionally taxing to to trade through, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so um, there's a certain value in uh, and as you get older of conserving your energy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to put a huge, you know. It's like okay. We all get angry every once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens? You're really angry. I mean, you could take two, three days to recover. Mm. You're still feeling messed up. You're still feeling like you got a hangover three days later. You, know. um, you don't want to go there when you get older. Mm. Okay? You know, some people doing stuff, you know, it's making it maybe uh, would be upsetting to you if you were 20 years younger. Mm -hmm. Just roll off your back, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the trading. You know, you start starts chopping around like that. Maybe you take a couple of stab trades over in here or whatever. You know, you end up scalping out of it or whatever, and you say, oh, you know what? I'm done for the day. Mm -hmm. you know? 
I'm up 200 a contract, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, today's crude inventory day. Uh, there were, you know, there are other things that I know. Uh, for example, we know that there was a tremendous amount of accumulation in this market at 3015. Well, that was a low, a low today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday, um, someone bought 1,500 contracts at 3050. Mm -hmm. So we knew we'd find support there. Mm. You know, because um, they defended it. As a matter of fact, at 3020, they picked up another thousand contracts today, or something. So somebody was accumulating massive crude oil at uh, at 3015 to 3020. Mm. So you know that because you just hear all day. You see the you see the order book, mm -hmm. and um, and you see their orders getting filled, and you're, you know, it's not spoofing. So that order stays there, and it gets filled, and you're like, wow, man, somebody's loading up some big longs here, big longs. And so uh, you know that'll get defended. So you might not trade it right there. You know, you might, uh, you might wait for the alternation, for the, for the expansion. Mm -hmm. You might try and catch it over in here. Yeah, I think that's where I took my trade today. I got, um, I took one trade. I was just waiting for it. I got, I think, twelve ticks out of it, and then oh, that's nice. all I did. Yeah, there you go. Um, and the nice thing is that you don't try to predict oil. You just trade your edge. You trade the statistics. Um, yeah, like I said, you're laying into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know what the stats are. Um, cause I, you know, I got a system, um, that'll give me trades all day long, you know, one after the other. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do like to position myself for the time that it's going to go. You know, I want, I want price moving away. You know, I don't want to get in a, in a, a $40 trade. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to get in a. You know, two or three hundred dollar trade. Yes. So, um, am I an absolute master at that? Absolutely not. It won't work that way. Mm -hmm. But you try and get that good trade placement so that your risk is lower and uh, for the opportunity of the expansion. If you can get that, if you can get that down, trade placement, then you know stops are absolutely meaningless. Right. You know, good trade placement, position for range expansion, uh, in alignment with the statistics, and um, and that's just you know smart trading with the edge. So the the question the question that you posed was you know what do you do to get an edge? Uh, you get you get some measure, whether intuitive or otherwise, that things are aligned in your favor. So that you know that when you get stopped out, you didn't make the wrong decision. Because mm -hmm. if if you if you know you didn't make the wrong decision, then you'll learn. But if you don't know whether or not you made the wrong decision, then you're in a void, and you can't correct your behavior. You're gonna do it again. And if you can't mm -hmm. correct your behavior, you're just screwed, man. And then and then you're just, you know, then you're just, you know, the, what do they call it? Revenge trading. Mm -hmm. Right. You just start clicking the button. Yes. We've all done it. We all know what it is. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. No. Smart guys out there, and you're you're going to make exactly the wrong decision if you're not in alignment with all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, alignment within yourself, alignment with the market, alignment with some. I I like to use statistics because that's what my educational background is. Mm -hmm. and, and and I just do it in a rough way. You know, if you look at my spreadsheet, the guys that are in my trading room that make these beautiful spreadsheets, mm -hmm. masterpieces. <laughs> Mine look like a garbage <laughs> pile because I don't care. I just want the information out of the sheet. Yeah. I just get it out of there, and you know, if I had to share it with somebody, they'd go, "Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, look at this guy's work." <laughs> the teacher put a big red F on there or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I got the, I got it, I got the answer, mm -hmm. you know. I'm, I'm, but I've been doing it a long time, yeah. so I, you know, I don't. Uh, um, one of our members is very meticulous, and he. If we do a little uh, research uh, project together or whatever, he demands that I that I uh, <laughs> present, you know, and that's good. It's, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. 
and I, I enjoy working with other people on research projects too. Like you know, you and I worked together for a long time, and uh, there's a there's a there's a joy uh, in in the stuff. There's a joy in it. Yeah, this business of trading is not as isolating as a lot of people think it is. There's a lot of great people out there that you can connect with. Yes. Yeah, and there's a lot of really smart guys. And and another thing that happens with the sharing to uh, Vadim is um, it, you might find, in fact, I pretty much guarantee you find, that if you get into a community of, uh, of guys that you're trading with, um, you're going to, if, if you're open with your ideas, um, if you're open with your ideas, um, what they're going to do is they're going to come back at you and they're going to go, oh, really? Um, yeah, well, I always did it this way. Uh -huh. go, and then you're going to go, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, I've been doing this for 20 years. I never thought of that one. Mm -hmm. and then you go, let's test that. Let's mm -hmm. run some stats on that and see what we got. Oh, wow, man, we really found something here. You, you could find situations where one guy's got an idea and another guy's got an idea and they're not really you know, independently, not really worth that much, and then we start putting stuff together. Um, you end up finding out that uh, there's an edge there. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing about edges that I want to talk about before we finish up for today's session is um, it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, you ask me, hey, how many days do you use for that? Uh, how many days do you use for that uh, median range? Five. Mm -hmm. When when do you, you know, when do you look at a new value every day? Mm -hmm. Every day. Now you'd be amazed. It'll come down. It'll tag that number, and it'll it'll bounce off. Of it. mm -hmm. so I know. I know. Smart money's looking at it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it won't come back through it later, but it'll bounce off of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and not every single day. Some days it'll go crashing through it. But mm -hmm. but uh, but. Uh, these are things that you know that other trade. So uh, you know, I talked about. Okay, is your trading decision based on reality? Yeah, they hit median range and they fade it. You know, everybody's getting out there. Mm -hmm. The whole mood of the market changes after it hits that number. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have, I witness every day that that this number is, uh, has meaning. You know, and so um, you find that by being there. And doing the work. Mm -hmm. Trading's hard work. Yeah, there's no shortcuts really. Yeah, it's hard work. Um, but if you have passion uh, for it, you know, like the shoe store guy, mm -hmm. um, then uh, it's a lot of fun. And it can be very, very rewarding. We've yeah. got a guy in our room that's uh, made a million and a quarter in the last six or seven months. Mm. Very aggressive, but, but, um, uh, but the confluence of ideas, again, it's a sharing of ideas that mm. made that happen for him. He had lost a lot of money before he got there, and and the things lined up for him, and, and he's in alignment with himself, and mm -hmm. uh, he thinks about money the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's another issue that people get into if they trade, uh, if they trade money, if you're doing it for money, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to not end well for you. Mm. Um, you got to be trading from process and passion, and then the money will be a natural result of that. Because but I say that's true. With, it, right? Yeah, it's true with anything in life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I wrote an article about this recently on our blog. Um, you start with happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, you don't say, "Oh, I'm going to be happy if," mm -hmm. if you know, if if I have, you know, if I go long and the market goes up, then I'm happy. If I go long and the market goes down, then I'm sad. Okay, what are you saying there? You're saying 100% of the way I feel is due to external uh, forces acting out. What are you, like a, a billiard ball on a, on a pool table? <laughs> you know, emotionally? Right. You're just a, a roller coaster. Yeah. You have no stability whatsoever. You've got no plumb line for the way you're dealing with reality. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, I take a trade long. It's going against me. I know they made the right decision. I don't give a hoot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stop out. Okay, so what? You know. Right. So like what? you talked before about how trade is uh, not an event. 
yeah, we've t we've talked about it from that perspective too. The trade's not an event; it's it's just something that's happening in a bigger it's picture. Part of a process. It's part of a process, and it's part of a bigger picture. Yeah, and it's funny actually. I uh, I wrote a quote I came up with. Uh, uh, can't find it right now. About a month ago, and I wrote, uh, uh, "I was happy first, then I became rich." Right. So, yeah. people people have it coming backwards. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's a lady, um, it's kind of a neat book, The Secret of Successful Failing. Mm -hmm. Gina Mullen, I don't, I don't remember her last name, but uh, Secret of Successful Failing. And you don't necessarily have to read that, just get happy. Mm. You get happy, man, all kinds of cool stuff starts happening. Mm. You just attract right. happy. Right, right. You know, mm -hmm. you attract happy. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, and this is why, I, again, you know, we come back to it again. Trading is a way of learning how to be happy in the face of absolute adversity. Because if you're material and concerned with money and everything else, if you're trading money, you're screwed. Um, I've had I had an incident uh, last year. I was trading 15 lots in the Russell, mm -hmm. and my trading platform locked up. Mm. Now, I was up three grand on the trade when I realized that my trading platform was locked. Mm -hmm. I called the trading desk and um, and it used to be a call the trading desk was for account number, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Sell 15, you know, set, you know, TF market, whatever. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they'd execute your trade for you. Yeah. Well, these days you call a trading desk, they're like, oh, hmm, uh, what's this guy doing? Oh, he's placing an order. Well, well, well what's that? Oh, hold on while I turn my platform on. <laughs> oh, five minutes goes by. Yeah. All right. By the time I got out of the trade, I'm down uh, three grand. So, you know, wow. I, where I would have was trying to close this trade at 2,500 or three grand because uh, I clicked the button and it wouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And... um and so I effectively lost six grand in like five minutes. Wow. Well, I went on tilt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went on tilt. When was this? I was maybe in mid year. Mm -hmm. I went on tilt. I didn't just go on tilt for an hour or two hours or one day. I went on tilt for like two weeks wow. because of that because of that event. Mm -hmm. It threw me off that much. Mm. I had to I had to scale way back down and, and like start over. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so you know, I mean, I've been doing this for all this time, right? Mm. I got, you know, this thing happened. It it was nothing of my own fault, just a matter of circumstance. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before. Mm. I didn't. I didn't know how to manage the situation. Um, I didn't know what the solution was. I lose three grand in five minutes when I, when I should have made twenty five hundred or three grand. Um, I was really disturbed, but the but I was disturbed enough that it lasted for days, mm -hmm. and I ultimately had to pull my I pull myself back down to two lots again, mm -hmm. and started started ramping it back up again. But but uh, the I, so what happened is I, you know, I went out of alignment because nothing there was my fault. Um, but yet, you know, I have to take responsibility for what it is. Mm -hmm. So I was struggling with that kind of, well, it's not my fault, but yeah, but you still have to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. It may not be your fault, <laughs> but you're still, you know, it's still your account, right? Mm -hmm. And I had trouble trading. Mm -hmm. you know? So I had to get myself realigned. Mm. And, so, um, and on that note, I say, you know, start small. You know, the guy that I just described that made, you know, a million two. Mm -hmm. He started with two lots. Right. You know. What's he trading now? Uh, about 15. Mm -hmm. Sometimes make 30, 40 grand a day. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Well, um... About uh, over an hour and a half now, we 
only covered about 10% of what I wanted to ask you. So wow. we'll do uh, another video soon and post it, and hopefully more to come. Yeah, I think this idea of uh, just interviewing uh, is good, um, and kind of I'm just open and and so uh, whatever questions you have, uh, let's bring them out and share them with people because I think it's of uh, it's of good value. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been down the road a couple of times. I've had the wonderful opportunity of trading millions of dollars. And there's a lot of traders out there uh, trying to get um, uh, get their edge and uh, find their alignment. Mm -hmm. And the ways that you do that is that you kind of uh, learn what the big picture is, and the and and if you can have somebody kind of share uh, some of the pitfalls that you run into along the way uh, with you, uh, can really help uh, in in keeping you on track. So thanks for uh, yeah having me today for the interview. No, thank you for uh, doing this. And uh, next time I want to uh, touch on things like uh, NLP and trading, meditation, uh, money management, um, uh, you know, cycle trending, trading, um, t best time to trade, all those, all those good things. Yeah, a lot of, lot of good ones in there. Mm -hmm. So very cool. All right. All right. Thank you very much, me. Rob. All right, man. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.